Good evening. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming and acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forum's lead sponsor, Bank of America, Raytheon, Boston Capital, the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe and WBUR. Let me begin, Mr. Carroll, by welcoming you back to the Kennedy Library. We are always honored by your presence. In the acknowledgments to his masterful new book, The Years of Lyndon Johnson, The Passage of Power, Robert Carroll praises one of his best sources, George Reedy, who served as a top aide to LBJ. President Johnson himself once quipped, when you ask George the time, he tells you how to make a watch. <laughs> it might be said that when you ask Robert Carroll about power, he tells you in meticulously researched detail how men like Robert Moses and Lyndon Johnson amassed and then used power to build highways, electrify hill country towns, win elections, get rich, pass legislation, secure the presidency, and then use our nation's highest office to advance monumental social change. In President Kennedy's last address in his home state of Massachusetts, he touched upon the topic of power when dedicating a new library at Amherst College to Robert Frost, who he described as one of the granite figures of our time, whose contributions were, quote, not to our size, but to our spirit, not to our political beliefs, but to our insight, not to our self-esteem, but to our self-comprehension. The draft of that speech that JFK was given by Arthur Schlesinger included the line, when power inebriates, poetry invokes sobriety, which in Kennedy's own hand, we see change to how he delivered it, when power corrupts, poetry cleanses. Robert Caro has spent a lifetime analyzing what the use and at times abuse of political power reveals about us and our leaders. His newest volume focuses on how LBJ used the power that was bequeathed to him after the tragic events in Dallas to new ends, ultimately describing Johnson's assumption of power as perhaps his life's finest moment, not only masterful, but in its own way heroic. Through Mr. Caro's richly painted canvas, we also get dazzling splashes of Johnson's colorful persona and persuasive powers. That man will twist your arm off at the shoulder and then beat your head with it, <laughs> Senator Richard Russell remarks, and he was a friend. <laughs> In conversations with Johnson, noted civil rights leader Roy Wilkins, you never quite knew if he was out to lift your heart or your wallet. Our moderator this evening is Mark Feeney, arts critic for the Boston Globe, author of Nixon at the Movies, winner of the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for Criticism for his penetrating and versatile command of the visual arts from film and photography to painting, and a frequent and welcome guest on this stage. Our national landscape is adorned with memorials to past leaders from the profiles on Mount Rushmore to the monuments to Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln off the National Mall and the more recent memorials to Franklin D. Roosevelt and Martin Luther King Jr. There is a place for such public art that elicits, that elicits national pride and lifts our self-esteem. But perhaps more importantly and a greater gift to our people and to posterity are the words carved so carefully and often so poetically by Robert Caro. In one of the final chapters of his new book, which is on sale in our museum store, Mr. Caro describes the steps Lyndon Johnson took while at his ranch in Texas during his first Christmas as president to hatch a strategy to pass revolutionary civil rights legislation and launch the war on poverty. The chapter concludes with this marvelous image. The ranch was just down the road from the Junction School where, as a small boy, LBJ had scrawled his name across two blackboards in letters so large that his schoolmates, become old men, still remembered the huge Lyndon B. on one blackboard and Johnson on the other. The program that he would announce in his first State of the Union in January was of dimensions so sweeping that with it he was trying to write his name across the whole long slate of American history. Robert Carroll has left his own mark on that slate by interpreting these defining moments in our national story. He is indeed one of the granite figures of our time, whose books will stand for centuries 
as lasting monuments to our shared history, contributing, in President Kennedy's words, to our spirit, our insight, and our self-comprehension. Please join me in welcoming Robert Caro and Mark Feeney to the Kennedy Library. We're all here at the John F. Kennedy Library, and of course, we're here to talk about John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. But before we do that, I'd like to talk about John F. Kennedy and someone else, Robert A. Carroll. <laughs> uh, if my math is right, uh, the second presidential election you were eligible to vote in was the 1960 election. I won't ask you which candidate you voted for, but I would be curious to know what the young Bob Caro thought of the still relatively young Jack Kennedy. <laughs> well, he touched something in me. You know, I still remember, actually, his inaugural address, and I which I, you know, it just, I think it touched something in my whole generation. Uh, someone once said to me at Harvard, everybody was, one minute everyone was going to law school or business school, and the next minute they were all in the Peace Corps or going to join the Justice Department. I think that's the way I felt about it. Next week, uh, you'll be appearing at the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas, which of course is in the former Texas Book Depository. Do you remember where you were when you first heard of President Kennedy's assassination? Well, actually, I do. I was one of the last people in the United States to hear about it. No one ever asks me that. <laughs> I was then in the middle of the Mojave Desert. I, had been, I was an investigative reporter for Newsday. And one of the things I had done a series on were these retirement, fraudulent retirement home site in the sun developments in the middle of the Mojave Desert where there was no water, but they were selling them to retired policemen and firemen mm -hmm. who couldn't afford better retirement homes for just $1,000 down and $100 a month. And I had discovered they were fraudulent. And I'd written a series of articles on it. And the Senate had decided to investigate. So they sent a couple of investigators down with me. Because a couple of four or five people, all the elderly ladies, tried to live down there. They had taken their life savings and given it to these developers and had gone down there. There was no water or anything. And we had found these people. They all had to carry water like a half mile to their, to their homes. And I was trying to find them again so the Senate could bring them back and have them testify. You couldn't get radio reception, at least on our mm -hmm. car radio, in, in that desert. So we were there all day. And as we were heading back toward the main highway, just before that turned up to Las Vegas, where we were staying, a truck driver started waving frantically at us. And we pulled over. And he said, the president has been killed. Mm -hmm. And um, that was how I found out about it. Mm -hmm. You write a great deal in the book about the relationship between John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Could you talk a little bit about that for the audience here now? Sure. Well, it's, it was a fascinating relationship. You know, it started when Johnson really was majority leader, and Jack Kennedy was a young senator, not that interested in the Senate. To Johnson, all that mattered was how you were, how, you, how effective you were in the Senate. And he had absolute contempt for Jack Kennedy. His actual quote, if I recall it from my book, is he was pathetic as a senator. He didn't even know how to address the chair. And Johnson, of course, also, President Kennedy was then, of course, in very bad health. And his back was terrible. He had these two operations. And Johnson mocked that, you know. He said, did you ever see his ankles? They're only this big around, he used to say. And he's sickly, yellow, yellow, not a man's man. And therefore, when Jack Kennedy starts to run against him for the presidency in 1958, as for Kennedy's feelings mm -hmm. about Johnson, of course, if you were in the Senate, you had to consider you knew Johnson was this incredibly formidable man. But Jack Kennedy was a great politician in his own right. And he realizes something that Lyndon Johnson doesn't realize. The Senate isn't the place to run for the presidency for. He realizes the power of television. And he realizes that if he travels around the United States, often with only a single aide, Ted Sorensen, you know, often 
for much of this time, he and Sorensen would travel around in a little plane together. Someone once said the best hopes of America were in that plane. Mm -hmm. So he's running around the United States getting delegates, making speeches. Uh, Johnson doesn't realize what's happening to him. Johnson thinks he has the presidential nomination. By the time he wakes up, it's really too late. Mm -hmm. But uh, Kennedy would later say that he could not have won the election without Johnson. Yes, that's one of the uh, Kennedy's say, you know, mm -hmm. most history books don't give him that credit. Jack Kennedy puts Lyndon Johnson on the ticket, really, because no Democrat is going to carry the country without carrying Texas. What no one remembers is that Texas, although we think of it as a democratic state, actually Eisenhower had carried Texas in both 1952 and 1956, in 1956 by over 200,000 votes. So Kennedy has to have Texas, and even more, Eisenhower had taken five of the 11 supposedly solid South states. Kennedy had to get some of it back, some of those states back. Johnson wins them back uh, in this incredible whistle-stop tour across, across the South. And uh, really, Kennedy would not be president without him. Mm -hmm. Would he have kept him on the ticket in 64? <laughs> Everyone wants to know if he would have kept him. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it's such a fascinating question. Because the first thing you have to say is every time President Kennedy was asked this question, which he was asked with increasing frequency in September and October and November of 1963, he said, of course he'll be on the ticket. But a number of things were happening. Uh, there was this great scandal in Washington, the Bobby Baker scandal. So Bobby Baker, which some of you I see nodding your heads, uh, his picture was on the cover of every national magazine he was on the front page of every newspaper. But although his nickname was Little Lyndon, nobody had yet linked Lyndon Johnson directly to Bobby Baker. That very morning, as President Kennedy's motorcade is driving through Dallas, a witness is testifying in a little, building, little room in the Senate office building in Washington, and he's giving the investigators for the Senate Rules Committee documents which for the first time will link Lyndon Johnson to this tr tremendous scandal. At the same time in New York, as the motorcade is driving through Dallas, in Life magazine has been investigating Lyndon Johnson's finances for months. They have nine reporters who have been going around Texas and they've discovered that although Johnson was always in, throughout his life on a government salary, he had become a millionaire many times over. And they had been assembling a series on what one of them called Lyndon Johnson's money. And they were preparing to run the very first of those articles in, that week's, in the next week's issue. So things were about to change um, as that motive. How much it would have changed, we don't really know. But it was just, if I say something about learning, you know, doing research, what's so great about it, you know, you come across this testimony by this witness, you know, which is in itself fascinating because in the Rules Committee documents, which nobody has ever apparently written about before at any rate, whether they looked at it or not, I don't know. You're, you're reading this fascinating stuff and then you're saying, you know, you go back to the front to start taking notes in more detail and you say, you see the date, November 22nd, 1963, and you say, when was he testifying, you know? And then later on, you see somebody saying, so we started this morning at 10 o'clock. That's about the time Kennedy was getting on the plane for Dallas. And he testified till 2.30 in the afternoon. And that meant that while he was testifying, the president was shot, taken to Parkland Hospital. Um, why didn't they stop? because no one remembered in the excitement of the day that they were there in this room. About 2.30, a secretary comes running into the room saying the president has been killed and they adjourn the, uh, uh, the, the testimony. Shortly after Johnson became president, you quote him in the book as saying to Ted Sorensen, 
well, your man treated me better than I would have if the positions were reversed. Could you talk a little bit about how Kennedy treated Johnson in office and how Johnson, how do you think Johnson might have treated Kennedy? Well, the, the first part I can talk about no. pretty specific, specifically, it's a very sad story, sort of a poignant story, because um, when Johnson because, becomes vice president, he, of course, makes his own power grab to get, he's, he's although Kennedy has won the presidency and beaten him for the nomination, he's still underestimating him. And shortly after the election, he has drafted and presents to Kennedy, assuming that he will sign it, an executive order that actually would have given the vice president supervisory power over several government departments. And he also asked Kennedy for an office in the White House, in fact, right next to his own, to, to, the, to the Oval Office, and he asked for an enlarged staff. And Kennedy handles it with such grace, he simply says, now give him an office across the street in the executive office building, and he doesn't give him any more staff. He has a very small staff. As for the executive order, Kennedy simply ignores it. He never uh, mentions it again. Right about that time, Johnson says to someone, I think it's George Reedy, in fact, mm -hmm. you know, he's a lot smarter than I thought he was. And a, lot, <laughs> and a lot tougher, too. <laughs> so Kennedy thereafter, for a number of reasons, some of which are, you know, you wonder about, some of which are quite specific. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, Jacqueline Kennedy was to write Ted Sorensen that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think the exact quote is, you must know how frightened my husband was that Lyndon Johnson might become president one day because of Johnson's hawkishness during, during the crisis. But whether it was because of that or whether it was because of personal reasons, the Kennedys cut Lyndon Johnson out of uh, power completely. You have to say Johnson is possibly the greatest lawmaker, the greatest legislator, the greatest passer of the legislation possibly in the history of America, certainly in the 20th century. And yet, he once was to say to Larry O'Brien, who was uh, Kennedy's legislative aide for legislative affairs, Johnson once was to say that O'Brien hadn't asked him for advice once in two years. So Johnson is cut completely out of power. Um, the Kennedy people, many of them, despise him. They look at him with real contempt. They have a nickname for him, Rufus Cornpone. They say that Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird they call Uncle Rufus and his little pork chop. They won't call him Mr. Vice President to his face. They call him Lyndon, which, which he can't stand. So, in, and this, of course, becomes common knowledge in Washington. So the newspaper headlines are saying things like, whatever became of Lyndon Johnson, what happened to Lyndon Johnson. And it's a terrible time for him. Um, it's the worst time of his life. Well, of course, his greatest antagonist in the administration was Bobby Kennedy. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about Lyndon and Bobby? Well, well, little may not be the right word to you. <laughs> Well, the Lyndon Johnson, Robert Kennedy story is quite a story. You know, sometimes when you try to analyze things, you can put political um, interpretations on things, and sometimes you just have to say they're just personal. You know, I always felt that way because of the first time that Robert Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson ever met each other. Uh, we know about it because two of Johnson's assistants, George Reedy and Horace Busby, his speechwriter, were, were present, and they told me about it. So it's 1953. Lyndon Johnson is the Democratic leader of the Senate. He's this huge, towering figure, this mighty figure, to whom everyone on Capitol Hill gives deference. Robert Kennedy is a 26. He's just been appointed uh, assistant counsel to Senator Joseph McCarthy's uh, investigating committee. So he's a 27-year-old, brand-new staffer. Every morning 
Lyndon Johnson has breakfast in the Senate cafeteria, which is on the second floor of this old Senate office building. And Senator McCarthy has a big table near the cashier's desk that he sits at with four or five of his staffers every morning. So this morning, Johnson walks in, it's, and there's a new staffer there, Robert Kennedy. And Senator McCarthy jumps up, as everybody did on Capitol Hill, to pay deference to Johnson. He says, good morning, Mr. Leader. Great job yesterday, Mr. Leader. Anything I can do for you, Mr. Leader? And all his staff jump up so Johnson can shake their hands. One person doesn't get up at that table, and it's Robert Kennedy. Well, Johnson knows what to do in every encounter of that type. So he walks around the table shaking hands and stops in front of Robert Kennedy and sort of puts his hand part way out like this. So Robert Kennedy has to get up and take it. And I asked, you know, Reedy says, in, try, in trying to explain to me what happens, Reedy said, did you ever see two dogs that didn't know each other that came into a room and all of a sudden there's a low growl and the hair starts to rise on the back of their neck. He says, those two guys just hated each other from the moment they saw each other. Of course, in the course of this book, you know, um, you see that there are other reasons, you know, what to come later. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go into it, but the, you know, the three times after President Kennedy, when he gets the Democratic nomination, at the, uh, 1960, and offers Johnson the vice presidential nomination. Robert Kennedy comes down the back stairs in the Biltmore Hotel three times to try and get Lyndon Johnson to withdraw from the ticket. And Johnson that hated him for that. Till the end of his life, um, John, when he, Johnson would have visitors down at his ranch in Texas, He'd take them by the lapels and lean his face into them and try to persuade them that it wasn't Jack Kennedy's doing, that it was Robert Kennedy doing it on his own. So there were so many sources of real, real hatred between the two of them. And um, that feeling between them is going to become, and I spent so much time going into it in this volume, because it's going to become a not so small factor um, in the way the history of the United States and Vietnam unfolds in 1967 and 1968. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning earlier your excitement when you're looking at the transcripts of the rules, House Rules Committee uh, yeah. uh, uh, investigation by the Baker yes. case. What, can you say which gives you more pleasure, research or writing? <laughs> I can answer the research. <laughs> <laughs> Writing is, writing is always hard. <laughs> but, you, but you do take great pleasure in it. Did I say that? Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, last fall, in the New York Times Magazine, there was an interview with Philip Levine, the U.S. Oh, poet laureate. Yes. Uh, and he said to President Obama, I voted for a man who is not as able and confident as I thought. It's foolish to say this, but the guy we need right now is Lyndon Johnson. Do you ever have people talk to you about how they wish Johnson were here, or do you ever think about, hmm, I wonder how Johnson would handle this? Well, I have people asking me that constantly, yeah. yes. And, you know, I often think about how Johnson would handle things because he had such a unique legislative genius, you know, at, at getting things through Congress. I'm not I, however, I'm not comparing him with right. Obama here. Right. Just talking about, you know, people think this, people, you know, you, if you watch the Sunday talk shows, every, you hear over and over again that this deadlock in Congress is unprecedented, that there was never anything like it before. But of course, that's not true. After uh, Franklin Roosevelt tries to pack the Supreme Court in 1937, the Southern conservatives and the Midwestern Republican conservatives, the Southern Democrats and the Midwestern Republican conservatives unite to stop the court packing plan and realize they, have, they still have the power in Washington. They are the committee chairman. So for the next 25 years, incredible as it may seem, no president gets a major piece of social welfare legislation through Congress. Uh, when Johnson takes office, 
1963, after the assassination. I, I'm not sure that this is right, but I think of the 16 standing committees of the Senate, Southerners are chairman of nine, and their allies are chairman of most of the others. And they have stopped Kennedy's legislation cold, not just the Civil Rights Act, but his tax cut bill, which was so vital to try to get the economy moving again, unemployment was unacceptably high at 5%. <laughs> and um, the economy was stagnating, and you needed more revenue, which a tax cut would provide by boosting business uh, for social welfare problems. And this has been bottled up. I'm just going to give yeah, one example sure. of Lyndon sure. Johnson, how he dealt with Congress, with legislative geniuses and a knowledge of Congress. So this bill was introduced by President Kennedy on January 11th, 1963. Now it's November 22nd, 1963, and the bill is still in Harry Byrd's Senate Finance Committee. And it's going nowhere, and it's not, and not about to go anywhere. There's still, I think, 183 witnesses, if I remember the number right from my book. And Senator Byrd is saying, well, we can't have any hearings this week because I can't get a quorum. And the Kennedy, and Byrd has said in sort of a offhand way, because he was a very courtly Southern gentleman, he says, you know, it would, be, it would be nice if the budget was about $100 billion. There has been no peacetime budget over $100 billion. And the Kennedy people think that because he's so polite, anything near $100 billion will be okay. And it's really talking about $102 billion. They're sure that will be all right. And they're talking, and Byrd has, and they're saying, well, we can go around Harry Byrd and the Finance Committee. They keep talking about going around Harry Byrd and the Finance Committee. The very night, not the Friday night, but the Saturday night after President Kennedy is assassinated, Lyndon Johnson calls to his office. He's not in the White House yet. He calls to his office in the executive office building. Kennedy's three top economic advisors, Walter Heller, who's the chairman of the Council of, e of Economic Advisors, Douglas Dillon, the Treasury Secretary, and Kermit Gordon, the Budget Director. And they start talking about the problems with the budget and the tax cut bills and getting them out of Harry Byrd's Finance Committee. And Johnson says to them, you don't understand. If Harry Byrd mentions $100 billion, he doesn't mean about $100 million. He means you're either going to bring it in under $100 billion or he's not going to release the budget or the tax cut bill. And then they start talking about, well, we can go around Harry Byrd and committee. And Johnson says, you can't go around Harry Byrd and committee. And they ask why. And he says, because there are 17 votes on the finance committee and Harry Byrd has nine. And they say, how do you know he has nine? And Lyndon Johnson says, because Harry Byrd always has nine. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's quite remarkable if you reach the th great things you find. Both Walter Heller and Kermit Gordon come out, and Douglas Dilling, excuse me, come out of that meeting and write memos for the record on what happened. And they both describe the conversation, you know, so, and they both say, all of a sudden, the problem was solved. Yeah. We give Harry Byrd what he wants on the budget, or we can have the tax cut. And that, all of a sudden, that bill starts to move. And that's an example of this great, really a talent beyond the talent, I call it, that Lyndon Johnson had with Congress. Is there anybody today who has anything like that talent, do you think, for exercising power or for understanding mm -hmm. how Congress works? I don't think that there's, a, you know, you're talking about Gene, really, I say, I use the phrase, you know, talent beyond talent, the gift that was more than a gift and was genius. I mean, I can give you another example of it if, if you want, just these the striking, unbelievable things. So the other bill that President Kennedy wanted was the Civil Rights Bill, and that's going absolutely nowhere. And on, I think it's the very night of the assassination, when he, as soon as he gets back to Washington, because what Johnson did is count votes. He was a vote counter. And he calls a senator who is just as pragmatic about that as him, George Smathers of Florida, and he asks, what's the chance of the Civil Rights Bill? And Smathers says, there is no chance for a Civil Rights Bill. The Civil Rights Bill is dead. He says, just let's recess for Christmas and go home, right? Johnson remembers that a representative named Richard Bowling of Missouri has introduced a discharge petition, uh, petition 
in the House. The Civil Rights Bill has been bottled up for all these months in the House Rules Committee, which was run by another Virginian, Judge Howard W. Smith. And not only would Judge Smith not even hold hearings on the bill, he wouldn't even give a date when he might hold hearings on the bill. And, but Johnson remembers that a freshman representative, not a freshman, a, re a representative named Richard Bowling of Missouri has introduced a discharge petition which would allow the um, House to, to take the bill away from Judge Smith's committee. Now, a discharge petition is almost never passed because it means violating the sacred prerogatives of the, of the committee chairman. And, um, a president never supports a discharge petition because that would get, you know, Congress, he, if he was interfering with Congress, that would get Congress's back up. Johnson puts in a call to Richard Bowling, and it's Lyndon Johnson at his best. The first five or six minutes of this call is Lyndon Johnson telling ha Bowling, of course we can't push a discharge petition, that would violate the Sacred House petitions. Then Johnson asks Bowling, but do you see any other way of getting this bill passed? <laughs> and he has Bowling say, no, it's the only lever we've got. And I wrote in the book, if there was only one lever, Lyndon Johnson was going to pull it <laughs> or push it. And in fact, sitting in the front row here tonight is Anthony Lewis, the great reporter of the New York Times. who was covering this very fight. And Johnson, in fact, then has a meeting of the congressional leaders and works them around in the same way to say, well, this discharge petition, they have to support. And Tony Lewis wrote in the New York Times, I don't remember the exact lead, but it's approximately what I, what I said a few, uh, before, the mood for civil rights changed on Capitol Hill yesterday President Johnson was throwing his weight behind the discharge procedure. And as long as I'm going on about J Johnson's great skills, but Johnson realizes that the civil rights groups, strong as they were and heroic as they were, do not have enough clout on Capitol Hill to persuade the, pers the conservatives to back a discharge petition. But who does? The church groups. And Johnson hears that that very weekend, 4,000 Protestant ministers are having a convocation in Philadelphia. And he sends word, don't go straight home to your districts, go through Washington. And newspaper reporters start to write, the halls of, of Congress are filled with clerics' collars. And the Civil Rights Bill starts to move. That's really yeah. genius, unique genius. Well, I know that many in the audience have questions, so I'll turn it over to them in a moment. But before we do that, uh, I'd like you to read a passage uh, from your book. And for someone who looks askance at taking pleasure in writing, I don't know how anyone could not take pleasure in, in writing this passage, which describes the situation on Air Force One after the assassination of President Kennedy uh, and with the swearing in of Vice President Johnson. Uh, I would add there are two microphones and so if you do have questions, uh, please come to one of the microphones so that people can hear you when you ask your question. And we'll start with those questions after Bob reads this magnificent passage. Well, it's in the, uh, it's in the compartment of Air Force One. And um, Lyndon Johnson is preparing to take the oath. And he's arranged everybody where he wants them. One witness was still missing, the most important one. He told Judge Hughes that, as the judge recalls his words, Mrs. Kennedy wanted to be present and we would wait for her, close quote. Do you want to ask Mrs. Kennedy if she would like to stand with us, he asked O'Donnell and O'Brien. When they didn't respond at once, the glance he threw at them was the old Johnson glance the eyes burning with impatience and anger. She said she wants to be here when I take the oath, he told O'Donnell. Why don't you see what's keeping her? The scene was still eerie. The gloom, the heat, 
the whispering, the low insistent whine of the jet engine, the mass of dim faces crowded so close together. But one element had vanished, the confusion. Watching Lyndon Johnson arrange the crowd, give his orders, deal with O'Donnell and O'Brien, Liz Carpenter, dazed by the rush of events, realized that there was at least one person in the room who wasn't dazed, who was, however hectic the situation might be, in complete command of it. She wrote, your mind was so dull, but one of the thoughts that went through my mind was, someone is in charge. Close quote. Carpenter, like Jack Valenti, was an idolator. But the journalists had the same feeling. On the ride out to the airport, Sid Davis, who, as he recalls, had not known this man except as majority leader and as someone who was thought of by some as Colonel Cornpone, had said to his colleagues in the car, it's going to be hard to learn how to say President Lyndon B. Johnson. As Davis watched Johnson in the stateroom now, it was suddenly no longer hard at all. Soon, immediately, we started to see the measure of the guy and his leadership qualities. Part of the feeling stemmed from his size. As he stood in front of Judge Hughes, towering over everyone in the room, the photographer Cecil Stoughton realized for the first time how big he was. Big, big, he loomed over everyone. But part of it was something harder to define. As Lyndon Johnson arranged the crowd, jerking his thumb to show people where he wanted them, glancing around with those piercing dark eyes, Valenti's initial feeling that this was a different man from the man he had known before was intensified. Johnson was suddenly something larger, harder to fathom than the man he had thought he knew. He looked, in fact, for the first time in three years like the Lyndon Johnson of the Senate floor. Now he had suddenly come to the very pinnacle of power. However he had gotten there, whatever concatenation of circumstance and tragedy, whatever fate had put him there, he was there, and he knew what to do there. When O'Donnell, obeying his order, went to her bedroom and asked Jacqueline Kennedy if she wanted to be present at the swearing-in, she said, I think I ought to. In the light of history, it would be better if I was there, and followed O'Donnell out to the door of the stateroom. A hush, a hush, every whisper stopped, the reporter Charles Roberts recalls. She was still wearing the same suit with the same bloodstains. Her eyes were cast down in Judge Hughes's phrase. She had apparently tried to comb her hair, but it fell down across the left side of her face. On her face was a glazed look and she appeared to be crying, although no tears were coming out. Johnson placed her on his left side and nodded to the judge who held out the missile. He put his left hand on it. The hand, mottled and veined, was so large that it all but covered the little book and raised his right hand as the judge said, I do solemnly swear. Valenti, watching those hands, saw that they were absolutely steady. And Lyndon Johnson's voice was steady too, low and firm, as he spoke the words he had been waiting to speak all his life. The oath was over. His hand came down. Now let's get airborne, Lyndon Johnson said. <laughs> 
this gentleman here. Yes, Hi. I, um, I wanted to ask you, you're a very prolific writer. I know you've, um, you've had to suffer a lot of your prose being edited out I'm of sorry? your books. So I know you've had to suffer a lot of your prose being edited during the editing process. And um, with modern technology, you can publish now without paper. And obviously the focus now is on this book and then finishing the series. Do you anticipate a day maybe when you might release an author's edition, similar to like a director's version on a DVD where the writer has full control of what gets to be included? Well, I'd like to do that. I think what you're talking about more is the power broker. We, I haven't really cut very much out of, possibly by mistake, <laughs> but I haven't really cut very much out of the Johnson books. Out of my first book, The Power Broker, we had to cut because they, we only wanted, the publisher only wanted to do one volume, so we had to cut out 350,000 words, which is a, a, a lot of words. Yes, the book as you read it is 1,050,000 words. As it is, is, was se is 700,000 words, but as I finished it, it was a million fifty thousand words. I would like that to be published uh, one day, but I have to first find out where all the missing chapters <laughs> are. <laughs> Over here? Yes, sir. My question is, um, what was the reaction of the Senators Byrd and Russell and Eastland when they realized that Lyndon Johnson, a man they had raised to power in the Senate, uh, was going to betray their dream of a segregated South. Could you all hear that question? Yes. That's a great question. It's one of the, I, I mean, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson had persuaded these people. You're quite right. They had raised him to power in the Senate. The South was behind him. That's how he became majority leader. They believed that he was on their side in civil rights. I once went down to ask um, Senator Talmadge, do you know how Lyndon Johnson had done that? And since you were black, I'm going to choose my words carefully. You know, he said, well, he persuaded us that he was on our side. I said, well, what did, how did he feel? What was his view of the role of white and black? And he said, master and slave. So they truly believed this, and Richard Russell truly believed it. So to think, what was their reaction? You know, when he, in his first speech to Congress, you know, it's, if I can just digress for just a second, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to go on too long, and I'll try to cut this as short as I can. <laughs> uh, Johnson becomes president, and he has to give his first speech to Congress, the joint session of Congress. And around his home, uh, at the Wednesday following the assassination, and around the kitchen table, on the Tuesday night around his home, four or five of his people are writing speech writers, uh, uh, write, putting together a speech. And <clears throat> Johnson is sitting there not saying anything. And they're saying <clears throat> on civil rights, don't spend your political capital right at the beginning on civil rights. Don't spend, now, the Southerners control Congress. If you antagonize them, they'll stop your whole program. It's a noble cause, but it's a lost cause. Don't fight for a lost cause. You know what Lyndon Johnson says? He says, well, what the hell's the presidency for? And in his speech, <laughs> yeah. and in his speech, he says, the first thing we have to do, the most important thing we have to do is pass Jack Kennedy's Civil Rights Bill. So as those words come out of his mouth, you see in the newsreels the Southern Senators, Russell, Byrd, Talmadge, the rest of them are sitting because they are the senior senators in this row uh, in front of this. And what was in their minds when they realized they had raised the man to power who was not going to do this to him? Yes, I'm sorry to go on so. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> My name is David Brosell. I'm a fellow journalist. Uh, thank you for taking my question. I've read all three books. I'm about a third of the way through this one. Um, all through the books, you write about Lyndon Johnson's thirst for becoming president since he was a boy and his pursuit of the ultimate power. When he finally did get that ultimate power, was it every, everything he expected it to be? everything he hoped it would be, everything he wanted it to be, or what? No, uh, you know, because the story of his presidency after this book 
is a very uh, dark story. The story of his presidency is, is Vietnam. Whatever he wanted to do, whatever he started to do, was ultimately swallowed up by Vietnam. Uh, so I think it turned out to be sort of terrible for him, actually. Yes, sir. Um, obviously, the theme of these books isn't just. I, Lyndon, I, I'm sorry. Uh, obviously, the theme of these books is, isn't just Lyndon Johnson, but it's you know the acquisition and the use of power. Right. And earlier in the volumes, you sort of take you know almost um, you know remove your eyes from how he's grabbing all this power. But then once he gets it, there's sort of a grudging admiration for him. But I also sense from the liberal lions in the uh, Senate in the 50s, Humphrey and Douglas, that while you're sympathetic to their liberal viewpoints, it almost seems like you have almost contempt for the way they don't know how to wield power, as Johnson knows how to wield power. Is that an um, accurate assumption? Well, I don't, no, I, I, well, it's a good question. I don't, I don't have contempt for them. Uh, for, I have, you know, a feeling of exasperation. Like, you will see in this book, you know, uh, Johnson gets Humphrey, makes him his lieutenant in 1964, and basically teaches him how to count, you know, and how to get things through the Senate, what strategic moves to make. And you really say, why didn't he know, why didn't Hubert Humphrey know these things, you know, before? It is true that the liberal bloc in the Senate could not get anything passed before Lyndon Johnson took up their cause. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the most difficult portions of your writing, <clears throat> your, your vivid writing for me, was early in Master of the Senate when you detail his treatment of his wife, Lady Bird. Uh, my questions are two. Did she ever speak of, of the, the, the pain of that to anyone as, as an anodyne, as a relief? And, and number two, uh, did she speak with you about that? And what were your, that you were able to say, what were your better sources about invading? I, I, I'm sorry, what was my what? Your sources, if, that those you're able to mention. Uh, who were able to help you invade that private space of his family oh. and his relationship with yeah. Lady Bird? Well, M Mrs. Johnson did speak to me for seven you know, long days. She stopped speaking long before I published any books. I, I don't know why. But she was very you know, helpful. We only, uh, she brought up the subject of a particular mistress of Lyndon Johnson's, you know, I don't go into, I, I go in as little as possible, um, his affairs, because most of them don't have any significance. But uh, as those of you who have read the first volume know, there's one that did have great significance with a woman named Alice Glass. And she, Mrs. Johnson brought up Alice Glass and spoke of her in the words I, I simply quote, you know, um, we were, at her kitchen, ta at her dining room table. And um, she was sort of sitting here. I was sitting here. We'd had lunch, and she I had my notebook here. She started talking about Alice Glass, saying, I think, whatever I said, it's been so many years since I wrote that book, that she was the most beautiful woman she had ever seen. And she taught Lyndon so much, you know, that, we're, that um, he was grateful for and played such a role in his political career, which at a number of crucial points she did. I myself, to tell you the truth, was so embarrassed by the, that I just sat there taking notes. I don't think I asked the question. Uh, but, you know, many, uh, w this was such a part of Lyndon Johnson's life that you can't talk to his secretaries or his assistants. They've written about it in books, you know, and you can't talk to them without this subject coming up. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
I just feel like I've uh, almost grown up with you. I started reading uh, Power Broker 1974, <laughs> and then I began waiting for the next publication and the Lyndon Johnson books. I read this book you just have here tonight. I read that last week. I couldn't put it down. <laughs> My question is this. Uh, we've been together for 40 years. Uh, <laughs> how long do I have to wait for the next book? <laughs> That started out as such a nice question. <laughs> well, actually, I'm hoping, you know, <laughs> but why would you believe me? <laughs> that this one will go faster because this, the book you finished, was originally supposed to be just like the first third of one book. Um, so I did most of the research, the bulk of the research, for those, for the whole book and that is done. So I'm hoping this will go a lot faster. Just one last point. Sure. Did you actually live in Vietnam? I read that Not, somewhere. No, no, we're going to live in Vietnam. You were going to? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about Richard Russell uh, during the uh, time of the start of the Johnson administration. Uh, he's, such a, he's such a dramatic uh, figure in the, the previous book. And in this one, it seems almost more like, like he's, he's LBJ's lieutenant uh, a bit. Uh, well, that's, that's going to stop right at the beginning of the next book because um, Johnson tries, you know, is determined to pass the civil rights legislation. And it's Russell's last stand, you know, to uh, stop it. Uh, you know, uh, however, you know, it's not so much that he's his lieutenant. You know, loneliness plays a part, big part, in the Richard Russell story. That's how Lyndon Johnson gets close to him in 19, when he first comes to the Senate in 1948 and 1949. There is this towering figure, you know, who simply is the most powerful, the most respected senator, but yet is this horrible, worst kind of segregationist who won't even vote for legislation against lynching. He won't, I mean, so Johnson gets close to him. You know, he stood, Johnson is, he sees men's weaknesses. He's this unbelievable sense. Everyone thinks Russell is unapproachable. But he's a bachelor, and he goes home every night to a bachelor apartment in Washington, reads all the time. His only life is the Senate. So Johnson starts to stay late. First he gets himself put on Russell's committee, then he starts to stay late at the Capitol because Russell's always staying late. Then he starts to say, let's get, you know, Russell gets a hamburger at some place, I forget the name, near Capitol Hill. Johnson starts to get a hamburger there. He says, come on home for dinner. After a while, he says, Russell doesn't go to people's homes for dinner. He says, come on, Johnson, you got to eat somewhere, you know. And Lady, he comes to the Johnson home for dinner, and Lady Bird is there, who just wins over everybody's heart. She's quite a charming, wonderful person, and a personification of the Southern womanhood that Richard Russell idolized. And the two girls are there, and gradually, very gradually, but steadily, Richard Russell becomes spends more and time, more and more time with Lyndon Johnson. So when you say, why didn't Russell oppose him on everything after he became president, you know, uh, you really have to think that there's an element there, a personal element, uh, that Lyndon Johnson's friendship was very important to Richard Russell. And uh, I think that's a big it's a big part of the explanation. Hello, when I visited, <laughs> when I visited the uh, Lyndon Johnson Library this, uh, this past January, I was very shocked to see a copy of a letter that Senator Goldwater wrote in July of 1960, uh, which included this sentence, it is difficult to imagine a person like you, and this is written you know, to um, Lyndon Johnson, like you running in a second spot to a weaker man. Now, it's not surprising that Senator Goldwater would write this letter, but I was surprised to see it on public display in the Johnson 
museum, because if you go through our museum here, our museum, um, I, I practically feel that way, uh, you'll never see anything disparaging about, you know, about Lyndon Johnson. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Um, well, <laughs> I'm, not sure, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I have a thought, you know, I have a thought on that. Um, so uh, it's an interesting letter, you know. There's still, you know, just on the, at least on the Johnson side, it would be silly to pretend that there isn't any feelings about the Kennedy brothers, um, John and Robert. Um, Johnson regarded himself as trapped between the two of them in history, as in a way he is, you know. He regarded himself, you know, uh, if you read the book that, you know, this book, The Passage of Power, you'll see how he felt so keenly, you know, that um, not only that they were better educated, but that he had been cheated out of an education, you know, because he had to go to what it was, he called the poor boys school, poor boys college, that he felt that um, they had social graces, that he had worked his way up, you know, and they were two rich kids who would go on, you know, had a rich father. He felt these things terribly deeply, and you can't really talk, well, they're all, I have to put it in the past tense because they're just about all dead now. When you talk to the Johnson people, people, you can't, this feeling so pervades them, you know, and, um, They may say for the record, you know, that it wasn't the case, but that is the case. And of course, on the Kennedy side, what they did to Johnson, you know, whenever Lyndon Johnson, on the rare occasions that Lyndon Johnson was invited during the Camelot years out to Robert Kennedy's home, Hickory Hill, he would be put at what Ethel called the loser's table, you know. And Johnson knew it was the loser's table, you know. And the insults on both sides are really uh, just startling. And the fact that they haven't been really written about, that we, it's not true, they have been written about, but I don't think they've ever been written about in the depth necessary to explain why they played such a, they were such a factor in the unfolding of American history, I don't think has been done. They're very strong feelings. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, goes along the lines of what you were just talking about. And I'm wondering whether Robert Kennedy's hatred of Johnson was exacerbated in hindsight when they realized that they hadn't used his power to get Kennedy's legislation passed. Um, and whether Robert felt that way and whether in hindsight any of the other members of the Kennedy administration felt that regret. No, they didn't. I, don't, I think I can say they didn't feel any regret. Um, I think there is a real feeling, and it's a very complicated subject. It's going to be gone into in the beginning of the next book. Would the civil rights legislation have passed if President Kennedy hadn't been assassinated, if he had been elected to a second term? Um, that's such a complicated, you know, question. Um, I know because we know from uh, Robert Kennedy's oral histories that he was very felt very strongly that Lyndon Johnson was getting credit for stuff that they had started and they would have passed anyway. And that, that's a tremendously strong feeling. And this, the feeling is just as strong on the side of Johnson partisan that it wouldn't have been passed if uh, Johnson hadn't become president. What do you think? I think I'm going to have to examine <laughs> it for, no, it's, it's such a complicated thing. I, I, I mean, and there's so many ifs, you know, if Goldwater hadn't been the nominee, if this, if that, I mean, there are 100 ifs. So I'm going to take a pass on a flat answer to that because I don't think there is a flat answer to that. Yeah, uh, yes, ma'am, yes. Wonderful presentation. <laughs> I'm just wondering, um, what advice could, um, what, what advice could our President Obama, or what could he learn from Lyndon Johnson? Well, I'm always getting, I, I have a much higher opinion of President Obama uh, 
than a lot of people who ask that question have. Um, I mean, I think he's accomplished quite a bit considering. Uh, so I'm not going to answer it in that, you know, in that way. You could say, what could President Johnson have learned from President Obama? How to inspire people, you know, the importance of rhetoric which touches things in people. Anybody, not just President Obama, would learn from Lyndon Johnson things about legislation because he is the greatest legislator. You know, Johnson says, I can't remember if it's the title of one of my chapters or not, to write it in the books of law. Right. You know, it is, yeah. I mean, in that first speech, which is just such, his first speech to Congress, he says that we, we've been talking about civil rights for 100 years. It's time to write it in the books of law. To Lyndon Johnson, some, that was, the, that was maybe in his view, the job, but certainly a job of the president, to write it in the books of law, to pass legislation. It's not enough to talk about legislation. Uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted it passed. And um, I think anybody, you know, in, in England, it's fascinating, to, well, this is sort of a boastful thing to say, but in, in England, the leading politicians, cabinet ministers of both parties, you know, always talking about my books because what he, they are parliamentarians, they are legislators, and Lyndon Johnson was the great legislator. So I think anybody would learn from Lyndon Johnson. I am constantly, I told you a story about Senator, the Civil Rights Bill, the nine to eight, and I told you a story about the, um, uh, excuse me, the tax cut bill and the Civil Rights Bill, the discharge. You know, I am amazed by the things that he pulls off. You cannot believe when Johnson starts in the last book to pass this first civil rights bill since Reconstruction. So you say that this is impossible. And you see the tally sheets. Johnson kept a tally sheet every day, the, the long, thin Senate tally sheets with the names of the senators down the middle and a little line on each side. And Johnson would put in a number you know, on each side as he got each vote. And the sheets are smudged, you know? And I asked, various of Johnson's people, you know, something that they said, you see the smudges, that was Johnson's thumb because he wouldn't move it on to another number, to the next line, until he knew which side that senator was on. I mean, it's, it's a great legislator. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, it's been 30 years since you published your first <laughs> book. Um, and my question generally is, in that 30 years, has, have any of your opinions of the man changed? Has anything evolved? And in particular, in your introduction to the first book, which I just was reading as I got here, um, you speak of the unusual degree to which the workings of his personality were, perhaps not on the surface, but in reality, unencumbered by philosophy or ideology. And in the introduction to your um, new, newest book, it really seems though that he does have a philosophy or at least some kind of ideology for the little man and I'm wondering oh. if, if that has changed. Well, if that's how you define ideology, okay. you, know, you know you are right. But my opinion of him, I, I wouldn't quite define, I would call it compassion, an overriding vast compassion for poor people and particularly poor people of color I think in that first book, you know, there's a chapter there called Cthulhu. And what that is about, I know I've said this a couple of times recently, and maybe I don't want to remember. When Johnson was 20 years old, he's in college and he's very poor and he doesn't have enough money. He has to drop out for a year between his sophomore and junior years to get enough money to continue. And he teaches that year in what was called the Mexican school in this little town of Cthulhu down near the Rio Grande border. And those kids, you know, they gave oral history reminiscences of all, and I wrote after reading them, no teacher had ever cared if these kids learned or not. This teacher cared. So you might say that that was just Lyndon Johnson trying to do the best job he could in whatever job he had, which was indeed a characteristic of Lyndon Johnson. But the reason I feel he truly cared 
was that he didn't just teach the kids, he taught the janitor. The janitor's name at the school was Thomas Coronado. And Johnson feels it's very important that he learn English if he's going to get ahead. So he buys him a textbook, and every day before and after school, Coronado says he sat, Johnson sits with him on the steps of the school and a textbook, and Coronado says Johnson would spell, I would repeat, Johnson would pronounce, I would repeat. I think he all his life had this compassion. When he gets to be president and he gives this speech, and some, I mean, Richard Goodwin, another one of his aides for a while, and of course a Kennedy assistant as well, says something to him and he says, I'll tell you something, I swore then, meaning back in Catula, that if I ever had the power to help these kids, I was going to do it. Now I have the power and I'll tell you a secret, I mean to use it. And I feel that's a continuing thread through his life. I just wouldn't quote. Yes, sir. Do you have any idea why Bill Moyers won't talk to you? No. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Excuse me. You've done so much uh, research in archives and interviews and listening to tapes. What were some of the occasions when you were so surprised or upset or thrilled that you couldn't sleep that night? Well, there have been a lot of things like that. You know, you, you find stuff in these papers that, you know, if you care about political power, it's sort of thrilling to watch Lyndon Johnson do it, you know. Um, um, one of the things was when I realized what he was doing, let's see if I can do this short, in passing the Civil Rights Bill of 1957. So on these tally sheets, he's so far behind, he knows he's not going to be able to get this bill passed one at a time. He's got to find a block of votes. And he finds one. In a flash, you know, if you were talking about an artist, or you'd call it an epiphany, you know, it's this flash of inspiration that there are 12 Western senators who want a dam called the Hell's Canyon Dam. If he can some way find a way to link them up with the South's willingness to let the bill go one step further in the legislative process without filibustering, and he finds that way. And as you, you almost see him they, putting this together, and you say, wow, you know, this is really genius. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, question is, after 30 years of writing about one person, do you, how has your personal feelings about him changed, and can you write for 30 years, do research, and not love the person? And does that bias you as a historian? Well, I don't think love is an applicable term. You know, people usually act, ask, do I like or dislike Lyndon Johnson? And I really say, as I think I once said to Mark years ago in an interview, um, those aren't applicable terms to me. I'm in awe of Lyndon Johnson, because these books aren't, you know, in my view, they're not supposed to be about just Lyndon Johnson. They're supposed to be about America in the second half of the 20th century and how political power changed it. It's about the workings of political power. And as I, I said a moment ago, so I won't repeat it, sure. watching Johnson doing, you're just awestruck by what he can do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. First, Mr. Carroll, thank you for your uh, books and your excellent uh, fact-based er erudite historical and political analysis. It's been great. I heard you speak over at the Kennedy Center, and I first wanted to speak to one of the issues you just mentioned. That time you talked about Johnson as the super legislator. Uh, shortly thereafter, I had the privilege of talking to uh, Ted Sorensen and Nicholas Katzenbach, and they were on the dais, and they were doing that. And so I had to ask the question that you more or less had primed, and that is, would the legislation, the civil rights legislation, go through? Katzenbach said he thought Kennedy would have done it. Sorensen, he said, possibly not. So I just wanted to give you that. Thank you. Sure. I didn't know that. Thank you. Second, um, your, your research is phenomenal. How much of your success do you think you owe to your wife, Ina, who's a Ina. historian and a, and a researcher? Well, Ina, I, I, owe a lot, I owe a lot of my success. I owe the very fact, you know, 
that I'm a writer uh, to Ina because when I was starting The Power Broker, we were really broke. I was doing this book on, you know, what we call the world's smallest advance. You know, that, that got less funny as time passed. <laughs> so I came home, you know, there was a point where I didn't know, you know, we didn't know how I could go on doing it. And I came home one day and Ina said, you know, we sold the house. So Ina loved that house. I didn't really care about it. But, uh, and Ina, you know, in the first place, you have to say Ina is a brilliant historian. She's written two books, The Road from the Pay, two books about the intersection of history and travel in France. She's a medieval historian. The Road from the Past and Paris to the Past. These books are brilliant books in themselves. She's also the only person I could ever trust, you know, to do research. Uh, because Ina has an absolute integrity. And if you, she says, I'll go down to the Russell Library, as she did, and I'll find everything there is to find. I'll go through all his papers on the Civil Rights Act of 57. You know she will go through every paper. And she also understands uh, what it is that I want. So if she finds, you know, she of course said, I found this isn't what you asked for, but I found something. I said, she's the only person that she is, you know, as I've written, as I call her, the whole team. You know, she's the only researcher on the books. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to tell a little anecdote about Linda Johnson, if okay. I may. Okay, sure. Um, JFK, of course, was Irish Catholic from Boston, Democrat, all of which I was, and I was able for the first time in my life to vote in the election for Kennedy, and about a year later, um, the four of us, uh, recent graduates from college, went down to Washington, D.C. for the first time, and uh, we happened to go into the um, Senate building, and we're get, getting on to an elevator, and the door opened, and um, Lyndon Johnson was on the elevator going up, so there were just the five of us. And so overcome with excitement and enthusiasm about Kennedy, not Lyndon Johnson, I started telling him how we were, we, were all, we were from Massachusetts and, you know, how excited it was to be there. And one of the girls mentioned, she was from Massachusetts, but she didn't mention that. She said she was from Rhode Island because she's working at the naval <laughs> base. And he immediately ignored us and turned to her and started waxing enthusiastically about Senator Green. <laughs> and being, being fairly intelligent, I realized, you know, he doesn't want to talk to us at all. <laughs> you know, I made a big mistake. <laughs> So uh, that's the impression I, you know, just that personal thing of that I, uh, That's a wonderful anecdote. <laughs> well, I never, I never forgot. You know, what, I wasn't really impressed meeting him at all. I didn't know that much about him, but I had followed and worked for the Kennedy campaign and everything, and it was my first, you know, introduction to politics, and everybody in Boston was so excited, you know, so. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, like a lot of people here, I've read most of these books. I read the first three. I haven't started the fourth volume. Um, it's okay. The test, is, <laughs> the test isn't until Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> but as I read these three volumes, I've never come across an American figure, political or otherwise, that has as much uh, drive, determination, and single-mindedness of purpose than LBJ. And one thing that I can't seem to square or reconcile, and I'm sure that your forthcoming volume will address this, but how do you take a man like LBJ that has that drive and determination and sense of purpose, and how do you square, square that with him not running in 68? And I realized that the country was falling apart at the seams. I realized it was after Tet, and I realized his approval ratings were probably at an all-time low. But if what you touched upon earlier, if for no other reason than to spite Robert Kennedy, <laughs> how does he not run in, in 68? How does, he how does he drop out or choose not to, to run? Yeah, well, that's another you know, very good question that I haven't come to my conclusions on yet as to why, why he does that. 
it's another very complicated thing where you have a lot of conflicting accounts. So uh, those things that I haven't gotten to yet, I'll have to take a pass. Okay. Thank you. All right, one, thank there's you. only one more person. Oh. One more question. A few years ago on President's Day weekend, I sat in this room at a forum on presidential tapes. And they played presidential tapes from FDR through Richard Nixon, each president. Right. And they played one of Lyndon Johnson speaking to Dick Russell. I think it was 1965. And I remember this very well because it made an impression. He was, he was talking to Russell and he said, Dick, he said, I know I can't win this war, but I'm goddamned if I'm gonna be the first US president to lose one. Now you must be familiar with that. Yes. And my question, and what's been bothering me for more than 40 years, is how could Lyndon Johnson, such a smart, experienced, clever man and politician, how could he be so blind as to the consequences of knowing that he couldn't win it, but refusing to stop it? And anything you can shed on that would be very... Well, I can't shed much on it tonight, you know, because it's, uh, again, you know, I wouldn't want to talk about it until I've written about it, you know, until I've gotten my conclusions. But I will say, you know, it's, it's so, uh, what you say is so accurate because it is a great mystery because when you read the notes, Johnson wouldn't allow minutes to be taken of the meetings of which the key Vietnam decisions were made, but there are notes that were taken. And each time you read the notes, you think, oh, they're, gonna, they're going to de-escalate. They, they have to de-escalate the, the arguments, but every time he escalates. Well, that's an exact, but most times he escalates. So it's a mystery, all right. Thank you very much. Books. <laughs>